I, uh, I don't know. It's kind of like uh, some have already said. It's a good thing, bad thing to have a lot of time to think about what you're going to say uh, one time when you get up. Uh, so I hope you're up for a little uh, levity this morning. Uh, I told somebody it's hard to tell a joke because you don't know if anybody's laughing or not. But I, I, like you, I've heard a number of things uh, that kind of give reason to laugh during all of this, and I think that's a good thing. One of them that kind of struck me as being funny is uh, talked about how many moms are locked in a house with uh, some extremely talkative children. And uh, somebody said, it's like having a deranged parrot super glued to your shoulder. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty good. Uh, by the way, I have had a number of people contact me about the bulletin article. You can go online and you can uh, read the bulletin. And uh, I usually have an article to, at the beginning of it. And this time, I decided to put some Bible questions uh, along the area, the timeline that we're reading our Bibles, uh, just to uh, give you an opportunity to see how many details you remember as you're reading. And I think I put 12 questions in it, and uh, you can decide if this is a, an, an admission or a confession or a disclaimer. Uh, I may or may not have deliberately substituted Solomon for Absalom in one of the questions. All right? That's going to answer some questions for some of you, and I'm not admitting anything. All right? Uh, I appreciate uh, what both Dave and Eric had to say this morning and everybody uh, that has had something to say. Uh, Dave made it clear that he wants to do something practical with this class about the Holy Spirit and not just be, you know, information. And he said uh, something like, I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit does more than just serve as a seal of our sonship, that he does something in our lives. And so I'm saying we're all trying to make, and one of the goals that we at Woodland Oaks always have is we try to make God's word practical. We try to make it real. Not just information that's thrown out there, but something that changes our life. Because if the gospel is not practical, then it's nothing. It's of no value. It's not just uh, this amount of information. And I appreciated what Eric had to say when he said, it's okay not to know what the plan is. And that's exactly right. Because we know who the planner is, don't we? And that's good enough. That's good enough. I think this is a really, really good time to be discussing the topic that we've been contemplating, and that is faith. Have you ever noticed that as circumstances and needs change in our lives, that we are impressed with certain things that maybe we've passed over before? Certain things that we never really stop to take notice of, and that's particularly true as we're reading through our Bibles right now. We run across things that are particularly applicable to our situation that we uh, are much more impressed with than we've ever been before. You notice things that speak to what you're going through at the time. And in view of that, let me share with you a passage that becomes particularly meaningful to me in the light of current distress that we're experiencing, a passage that you might want to read and, mot uh, and meditate on for motivation. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. And I invite you to just listen. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And now listen to what he's about to say. Not only so, but we rejoice also in our sufferings, 
because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And this hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by his Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And here's a good application of that. This is a unique opportunity to grow your faith. And we need to recognize that difficulties are necessary to cause and enable faith to grow. If, if everything, if plan A always worked for us, then we wouldn't need any faith, would we? Everything just worked out well. It's pretty obvious that our plan A doesn't work all the time, does it? I mean, right now is a pretty good example of that. And if we sit around and whine about how hard things are right now and feel sorry for ourselves, then we grow resentful and we grow discouraged. And by the way, if we listen to too much news, we get discouraged, don't we? And while I'm right there, let me put a little plug in right here. Uh, I have a daughter who this past week traveled to New York City to work with these uh, virus patients. Uh, I'm a little nervous, obviously, for her, but I also uh, have deep appreciation, respect, and love for her willingness to do that. And so consequently, we've been getting some pictures back and some texts back from what's really going on there on Ground Zero. and it's. Uh, with the group uh, that has set up the tents in Central Park, and that's who she's working with. And uh, you, you won't hear this on the news for some reason. You always hear about the people that are complaining about them being there and the fact that they have people, uh, if they're going to work and be a part of that, then they have to sign an agreement of kind of a faith agreement of uh, what they believe about certain things. And so you're having some people in New York and around our country that are really, really distressed that they're even allowing Samaritan's Purse to be there in the first place, even though it's not costing them anything. And even though they're there to save people's lives and to serve people. You're not hearing this, but at seven o'clock every morning and at seven o'clock Every, every evening, all of the people around Central Park who live in those high-rise apartments buildings and people assemble outside the barricade that they've set up there around those tents and they clap and they cheer and they sing to show their appreciation for these people being there. Now, our news is not picking that up. We're just hearing about the people that are complaining about it, right? And so I'm saying you can listen to too much of that. And they come, the people come, and they leave bouquets of flowers out just outside the perimeter there to show their appreciation for these people being there. And so I will say to you, be real careful not to allow yourself to become depressed over some of the news that we're hearing because there is an agenda that too many people have in the news. Here's a couple of one-liners to kind of help us remember to look on the positive side of this thing. All sunshine and no rain makes for a blank, what? Desert, right? And one more, the same sun that melts wax hardens clay. Think about that. Any given event, particularly if it's a difficulty, is going to soften some people's heart. And that very same incident is going to harden some people's heart. I want these lessons to be informative and practical. I want you to be able to talk to your neighbor about your faith in a reasonable, convincing way. And so we're trying to make these things practical. And if you've not thought through your faith to the point that you can tell somebody about why you believe, then you're afraid and you avoid those kind of conversations. 
But if you'll take some time to understand so that you can put into words why you believe what you believe, then you can talk to people. There are a lot of people that have lots of questions right now. We have lots of opportunities that we've not had, maybe in our entire lifetime, from neighbors. Maybe they're upset about what's happening. They want to talk about it. And you can give them a reasonable reason for the hope that lies within you. And so our first lesson back a few weeks ago, we noted that faith is a choice. And while it's not uncommon for us as Christians to be ridiculed for our faith, for instance, in the belief of an intelligent designer in the creation of the universe, somebody says, you can't prove that God exists. And I say to you, you can't prove that he doesn't exist. Just as reasonably. Consequently, we're both operating by faith. You won't admit it. I will admit that I'm operating by faith. Admittedly, I choose to believe that God exists, and I have reasons for my choice. And in our second lesson, we saw that faith is not passive. That's, people often confuse the concept and the understanding of faith and belief. And that's particularly important, and it becomes obvious whenever somebody says, if you'll just say the sinner's prayer, you'll be saved. And while belief and faith certainly are connected, they're not the same. Belief is the foundation of faith. We examine in that lesson, James chapter 2, to let the Bible give us a definition of what faith is. And he repeatedly says in that context, beginning in James chapter 2, verse 14, faith without works is dead. And he says, even the demons believe and tremble. And so faith is only complete, he teaches us, whenever our belief leads us to obedience. Have you ever thought, are been faced through some means with something that made you realize that what you're facing is so incredibly profound that you question whether or not you're going to ever really be able to totally understand what that is. A truth so deep that you're just, you just stand in awe of it. Well, I'll confess to you that I've spent much of my life trying to comprehend the full meaning of one such verse. And that's Romans chapter 1, verse 17. And it says, In the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith unto faith, just as it is written, by faith, the righteous will live. And that phrase in there, that it is by faith unto faith, and I've heard lots of people uh, give a meaning to that and, and, and rephrase it in different ways. And I say that, that that is such a deep statement that I think it is really the heart of everything about Christianity. It's about faith, from faith unto faith, our faith that develops faith. And I believe the most beneficial thing that I can undertake in my life is to grow my own faith and then to help you grow your faith. And so I want to lay a little more foundation to help us do that in this lesson this morning. The Bible uses the term faith in three different ways. The first way is the least used but for the sake of being complete, I want to address it. And it's found in verses like Jude verse 3. Now, I didn't say Jude chapter something verse so-and-so because Jude is a really short book and it only has one chapter. And so Jude verse 3, and it's a little short epistle in which Jude is warning his audience of Christians against some aggressive false teachers that have infiltrated the Christian community that he's addressing. And in his introduction, he says in verse 3, Although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation that we share, I felt that I had to write you and urge you to contend for the faith 
that God has once for all entrusted to the saints. That he said, I wanted to write to you and talk to you about the gospel and what we have in common, but I felt like there's something that's more overriding than that right now. You have some false teachers among you who are really wreaking havoc among the believers. And so I feel it necessary that I write to you about that and encourage you to contend for the faith that has, King James Version says, once for all been delivered to the saints. And so he's using the term faith here to denote a body of information or a body of knowledge that has been delivered to the saints. It constitutes the foundational principles of the gospel. And while that's probably the very least common usage of the term faith, it is obviously a legitimate way to use it as a body of knowledge that has been delivered. And then the second way the term faith is used, an example is in the passage that I read earlier, Romans chapter 5, verse 2. And I call this a functional definition of faith, or if you will, what faith does. And he says, therefore, Romans 5, 2, 1 and 2, therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Now, I realize that's somewhat of a complex statement and sentence, but let's go back and break it down a little bit and see what he says faith's role is or what faith does. And he's saying that faith is the avenue or the means through which we access or gain entrance into God's saving grace. You see, God's grace is available to all, but who's going to receive that? And how are they going to receive that? And that's why the accurate biblical way of expressing what role faith plays in salvation, I think the best way to say it is how Paul said it in Galatians chapter 2, verse 8. He says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And that's the accurate way of saying how God delivers his righteousness to us. It is by grace, it's a gift. Our salvation, our righteousness is imputed. It is not earned. And we individually receive that gift through our individual faith. And so that's the second way that the term faith is used in the Bible to describe faith's role in salvation, what it does. And then there's a third way that the term faith is used. And I would say probably the most common way that it's used, and I call that the doctrinal definition, what faith is. And we go to what is perhaps the most famous of all scriptures regarding faith faith, and that's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, which says, New International Version says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. I think it's possible that sometimes we hear a statement or a text so frequently that we take for granted that we understand it. And I want to make sure that we understand what this verse is saying. And so I want to take a minute and look at the words here. It says, faith is being sure of something. And the word, the Greek word that is translated being sure of, actually comes from two Greek words. The first one, it doesn't matter what the word is particularly, unless you're interested in that, but it's hupo, H-U-P-O, would be the anglicized way of saying the Greek letters. And that word means under. And the second word is stasis, S-T-A-S-I-S, -S, and it means to stand. And so you put those two words together, to stand under. Faith is what stands under. And a synonym in the English for that would be the foundation. Faith is the foundation of what we hope for. And then he says, 
And faith is being certain of, the New International says. The King James says it is the evidence of. And the word means attesting or approving to the point that we accept something. We've looked at the evidence, we've examined it, we've made a decision. And he says that, that there has been sufficient evidence to make us certain of what it is that we're looking at. So faith is the acceptance of something that we cannot see, but we accept after we have examined the evidence. So faith is not blind. True faith has evidence. It's not a blind faith. People accuse Christians of having a blind faith. Well, the same, act, the same accusation to go against people who accuse you of that, that very same thing. But my faith is not a blind faith. I have evidence for what I believe. And so thirdly, the most common usage of the term faith is now faith is the foundation of our hope and the certainty of what we do not see. You got that? It's important. That's what faith is. It's the foundation of our hope. It is the certainty of what we cannot see. And notice also that faith deals with what we hope for and what we cannot see. You remember Jesus' encounter with Thomas, his disciple, following his resurrection? In John chapter 20, I want to read this to you. I know you're familiar with it, but I want to read it to you just to put it back in your mind again. Now, Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, and listen to this, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and who have yet believed. That's us. That's me and that's you. He's talking about us. And so my next question is, can you believe something you cannot see? And the reasonable answer is yes, if there's enough evidence. And that's why John immediately in the next verse from what we've just read, verse 30 says, Jesus truly did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing or through faith, you may have life in his name. John 20, 30, and 31. Question. Is eyewitness testimony considered to be good evidence? I mean, of all the evidence that you can gather to try to prove a case, is eyewitness considered to be good evidence? Well, actually, even though we know that sometimes witnesses disagree, eyewitnesses is what, is what people are looking for to try to prove a case. Were you there? What did you see? And, and so it is some of the most valid testimony that can come before a court, particularly if you have several eyewitnesses who come from radically different backgrounds and who will testify to the same thing. That's powerful evidence, right? Let's go back to our passage in Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, we quite often refer to that as the heroes of faith. You know what we have in that chapter? We have a list of reliable witnesses. 
when he finishes, the writer of Hebrews, when he finishes telling us in chapter 11 about Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses' parents and Moses and the Israelites who passed through the Red Sea on dry land and Rahab and Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets and an unnamed host of others who were persecuted for their faith, then he immediately following that says this, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. We have witnesses. We have witnesses over a long period of time. We have witnesses that came from extremely varied backgrounds, and they all testify to the same thing. The word translated, uh, 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 I'm sorry, so I asked the question, can you believe something that you cannot see? And the answer is yes, if there's enough evidence. And this is exactly what the writer addresses in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, when he started this whole thing out. He says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that, listen, what was seen was not made out of what was visible. so that what was seen was not made out of what was visible. Because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not real. That's what he says. And he goes on to demonstrate that in the verses following that. The word that is translated, understand. By faith, we understand something. And that word is an interesting word because it means to perceive with the mind. You gather the evidence, you consider it, and you make a decision, and you perceive something because you can know something to be real even if you can't see it. Faith is about things we can't see. The Christians are not, we, we as Christians are not the only one that has faith. Everybody operates out of faith. There are some things that we can understand because we can use the scientific method, right? And we're all enamored with that. The scientific method has five basic steps. Number one, you make an observation. Number two, you ask a question. Number three, you form a hypothesis an educated guess, if you will, or an explanation that you can test. Number four, you make a prediction of what's going to happen whenever you perform this test. And number five, you test it and see what happens. Now, can you only believe that that you can touch, taste, feel, smell, hear? Is there, is there no other way that you can understand anything? And by the way, we also accept this type of evidence if not that we have to do it ourselves, but if there is a reliable witness that testifies that they've used that method, right? In other words, if a reliable person conducts the test and then writes up the results, if we believe that person to be reliable, then we can at least accept that as evidence, right? Listen to how the Apostle John, who spent three years living with Jesus, one of his very closest comrades, begins his first epistle. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, which our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it 
We testify to it. We proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and what we have heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And that fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. So we all accept things that we've not personally witnessed. Everything in history, when you stop and think about it, we accept from testimony of somebody, right? For instance, who was the first president of the United States? George Washington, right? Are you absolutely sure? How do you know that? Can you prove it? How are you going to prove it? The result is you believe it by faith. You have evidence. You have witnesses. You've considered it, and you've made a determination. Faith is not without evidence. Do you believe that the earth is round or flat? Now, this may sound silly to you, but it's getting less silly than it used to be. Are you aware that according to an August the 21st, 2018 article in the Scientific American, quote, just 66% of millennials firmly believe that the earth is round, according to the pollster YouGov. Now, they don't believe the evidence that most of us have decided to believe. And we can talk about why you believe that the earth is round, right? And you can tell me all the evidence. Well, they've seen that evidence, and they don't believe it. And I have a question for you. Does that make you wrong because they don't believe it? Does that make you wrong because they've seen the same evidence that you have and they don't believe it? Does that make you ignorant? Does that make you gullible? That's what people accuse Christians of being quite often, right? I'm certainly aware that it becomes more fashionable to ridicule Christians because of our faith, as if we're the only ones who believe something by faith, but we're not. Lord willing, we'll continue this study of faith in our next lesson, but I want to end this lesson where I started. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. For in the gospel, a righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith unto faith, just as it is written, by faith the righteous will live. Now we're about to sing a song that I requested that Sonny uh, put up for us to sing. And to me, it's, a, it's one of those songs that I, I find myself singing a lot these days. And it's a very calming song. And I hope that you will join in with us as we sing this song until we meet again next week. Thank you and God bless you. <laughs>